Thankfully, the unthinkable worst-case scenario never comes to pass. As tensions begin to subside, the consequences of the crisis play out very differently for Khrushchev, Castro, and Kennedy. At the Kremlin, the crisis is seen as a critical defeat. The Soviets sting not just from the loss of the strategic advantage in Cuba, but from the perception around the world that they are the losers in the confrontation. Khrushchev personally takes much of the blame. However, in many ways, it is his humanity that is most apparent in the communications between the two superpowers. One wonders whether his anxiety over the possibility of nuclear war affects his ability to negotiate effectively. He would be removed from power less than two years later. In Cuba, Castro is furious with Khrushchev for abandoning his country at the climactic moment in its showdown with the United States. Nevertheless, he would retain power for more than 50 years. Cuba continues to be a close ally of Russia, even after the fall of the Soviet Union. And it remains a staunchly communist nation, just 90 miles from American shores. For President Kennedy, the crisis marks a pivotal moment in his legacy. His handling of the crisis is marked not simply by a willingness to meet aggression with aggression, but rather by his skill in avoiding conflict. His decision to give up U.S. missiles in Turkey, despite the opposition of every single one of his advisors, shows Kennedy's commitment to peace, rather than a belligerent victory. Through his leadership, the danger of mutual annihilation between the two superpowers is narrowly averted. What kind of a peace do I mean and what kind of a peace do we seek? I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time.